I want also to lift this particular intro cartoon that we do have here in the start today, according to Victor, South Sudan power sharing deal. And of course, we discussed this largely with our panelists. Let's just begin on it. Uh, this particular development in South Sudan, uh, maybe you can bring us up to speed, uh, um, Irungu Hilton, as far, first of all, we're, it, we are happy that there's a deal, but also we are not happy that one of our panelists is still in the slammers. I thought this would have been part of a deal. <laughs> the handshake. No, despite that despite, is Peter Biarritz. I think, I think it was tens of um, American senators and uh, diplomats in Juba uh, called for Peter's release last week. And, yes. Um, it was a welcome development. I think the uh, petition is now in the range of uh, about 4,000 people who are calling for his release. Um, so I think there is a bit of sweetness, I think, for some of us in terms of discussing this issue, uh, that Peter is still uh, yes. incarcerated, and it's now 11 days. In fact, um, I, I respect uh, Nation Media Group too much, but I was going to actually hand out these um, statements here, because I think this is really what the panelists should be holding up um, for Let Kenyans. me see it again. Just uh, lift it so that we it's, can please. It's 11 days huh? um, since... Um, uh, Peter was uh, uh, arrested and currently is in detention without trial in the um, the Blue House, as it's called. Um, so there are a number of things. I think, first of all, we can welcome the agreement. Um, obviously, it is very limited. It's a power-sharing agreement. It doesn't deal with the uh, separation of powers from the central government and the regions. It also doesn't dismantle uh, the securitization uh, that has happened. So the National Security Act, for example, is not abandoned at this point. And that's the act that uh, the South Sudanese government is using to hold Peter and a number of other political prisoners. Um, I think the third uh, real area that we need to be worried about is the proliferation of the militia. Um, that over the last five and a half years, um, we've seen uh, you know, thousands of people lose their lives, but we've also seen a lot of citizens become quite militarized and um, weaponized. And uh, we fear for the peace agreement in the context of this not being uh, taking place. And the last one really, is that you know any peace agreement really should give space for building the system or the culture of public accountability. So if women's groups, uh, civil society organizations, media, mm -hmm. and others are not able to open up the democratic space to have a open debate about the future of South Sudan, mm -hmm. um, then I think we have to be concerned. Um, so I think that's where the leadership should move to now which is to free the society to be able to non-violently and democratically discuss the future of some of the big topics that are on the table. All right. So we want to just see also how fragile is this particular uh, peace agreement because it seems from uh, the humanitarian, uh, humanitarian perspective as well, that is uh, truly one thing uh, that has been captured and uh, according to some of the analysts that uh, also we alluded to uh, from this particular story. But looking at the cabinet we have a bloated cabinet and i think this is what peter uh, biara jack was really alluding to and maybe we can just get a snippet of what he said here on the show uh as a precursor to what we're discussing uh, today and this now has actually come to bear in south sudan with the deal as well let's just get that particular uh, a bind from uh, peter biara jack who was here i think uh, yeah, last month to talk about this particular power sharing deal uh, the whole concept is about power sharing. It's about dividing up the cake. This is what it has really essentially come down. So what IGAD is proposing is that the transitional government of national unity, this is Salva Kiir, Taban Dengai, and the group that is in Juba, uh, including some of the political parties that are allied to the government, those of Martin Elia, as a transitional government of national unity and the parties allied to them in Juba, they will get 60% of all the cabinet positions. All right? And then it says the SPLMIO, this is the group of Riyak Machar now. Uh, Riyak Machar will get 25%. Uh, this is what the IGAD is, uh, is proposing for them. This is uh, uh, for the SPLMIO uh, here. And then you have a, 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 another new entities that has emerged, a number of different smaller uh, arm group, including Paul Malong uh, group that joined not so long ago. Uh, this group, they call themselves South Sudan Opposition Alliance. Uh, they have been, they are proposing to give them uh, 10%. Then there is a group of former uh, political detainees. This is the group of former Secretary General uh, Pagana Mom, uh, former uh, Foreign Minister uh, Deng Alor and others. Uh, they will be getting 5%. Uh, then there is also another group uh, uh, where they have another opposition entity. So essentially what this thing is, uh, what IGAD is doing here is saying, let's divide up the cake. And based on the positioning on the ground, based on the political cloud, based on the different positions and arguments that they have reached, this will be the sharing of the cake. Now, they are proposing a cabinet of 42 ministers. 
This is a country that is extremely poor now, where uh, soldiers have been going for a month without getting salaries, where inflation is among the highest in the world. Yet IGAD is coming here to say that the cabinet is going to be increased from the present uh, 30, 32 cabinet ministers by another 10 ministers uh, to 42. They are also proposing uh, to increase the parliament from 400. Now, the last we used our parliament was only 332 MPs, and then in the last agreement, IGAD increased it to 400, and now they are proposing to increase it to 440. They are also proposing that we have three vice presidents. So you have a first vice president, you will have which will be appointed by the group of Yek Machar, the SPLMIO. You have a vice president that will be appointed by the government. And then you have a third vice president that will be uh, appointed by a coalition of other opposition entities. So three vice presidents, 42 cabinet ministers, 440 MPs. This is the breakdown of the numbers of what IGAD is proposing. And this is at a time when the economy of South Sudan is extremely in tatters, uh, where basically people have gone for months without getting their salaries, where basic products are very difficult to get. And we were talking about bodyguards before. And this is a, a, a country where if you are a minister, you are entitled a house, you are entitled a fleet, uh, you are entitled vehicles and all sort of things. So essentially, most of our budget, the entire resources of the country, will be going to maintain uh, these political leaders and their generals. This is the other part. There is a, a security arrangement where all of these guys in the bush that have declared themselves generals, and there is something of like 15 different rebel groups, and each one of them put on ranks, will be integrated into the army. So already now, as we speak, we have over 1,000 generals. It's likely that they may increase, I don't know, to, I don't know, we get new 200, maybe mm -hmm. 300, I don't know. This is essentially what IGAD is proposing. And of course, we've seen that that number has really gone up there. Uh, according to the current uh, figures that we do have, uh, we have four vice presidents. He was saying uh, they will have three. So the concern of Peter Biara Jack, of course, was put out there. And this, I think, also really rough, ruffled the feathers of uh, the Sudanese authorities as well. Let's just begin from uh, and discuss this particular blotted government and what he says we know the economy of south sudan right now uh, it has been you know a ground to a halt as far as uh, peace is concerned nothing has been uh, flourishing so that they can actually talk about robustly uh, growing the economy exponentially could we just discuss a bit of it about uh, the the blotted and this was his concern and it has really now uh, shaken into place i don't know uh, ambassador erasas moncha <coughs> briefly because this is from eager and uh, yeah. you were then also uh, the former chair, Correct. deputy chair of the African Union. Yeah, Dipal. I think, well, let me start with the positive note that when the president said at the signing ceremony that, well, this time the peace will work, accord will work because it's consensual. Last time, the last time it was kind of uh, pushed into it. It's very good news to hear him say that. But I still see his interest very big. One, there is, I think, one group that has split. They have not even signed or they have denounced this peace accord before even the ink could dry. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and the basis of which that they don't agree with power sharing, where, which you are asking, meaning that they want more positions to be given because the very basis of creating this unit government is based on what is on the ground. Mm -hmm. If you have a militia, you have a con controlling a territory, you are entitled to a position. Yes. So you are in a dilemma. Uh, the more the country is divided, the more it's going to be. But, and again, the president's entry is full now. Mm -hmm. Because as he moves in, one of the things that they should tackle is what Irungu was mentioning, security sector. Because in the last agreement, that was never dealt with properly. You still had Yak Marshal with his army intact. You had the government on one side, and they never were fully integrated. And that is how they ended up shooting each other and hell, I mean, uh, hell broke loose. So the first area that they should tackle now is integrated. Of course, have a plotted army, uh, but at least have one commander, because building a nation state 
where you have all these commanders is not uh, viable. Then, of course, there is the aspect of the plotted, but the economy. You have refugees, over 4 million people are dis either displaced are out of the country and they need humanitarian assistance. Yet, you don't have resources to address all that. On the pride side, the oil fields can now be switched on. Oil can start flowing. With the sanctions, the American sanctions, the oil prices are likely to remain high. So there could be a revenue stream coming in. I think they should move quickly first of all, to make sure that you start giving basic services to the people. Because the people are hurting. People need to be settled. They can go back to Thank their you. farms. Thank you. Uh. Right. Let's hear from uh, Momonza. Will this hold? Yes. Very um, briefly. Yeah. I, I, I would like us to tread carefully um, and with caution. Uh, one thing is uh, South Sudan is a friendly state, is our friend. And um, there is a way governments address each other. Um, um, and and, and uh, Irongo Hilton here is is doing what he's supposed to do because he's a he's a lobbyist. He has to you know talk about human rights and and all that, and and that's the way it should be. But again, um, there are other channels um, where governments talk to each other and how they approach each other, and there are ways through which um, advice can be can be put across. Uh, so that some of these things are handled, and uh, at the the level at which Sudan, South Sudan, is as a political system, mm -hmm. uh, is not uh, still you know at the at the continuum of democracy, uh, liberty, and all that is is is, is still not uh, at the level where uh, it should be. So there are things uh, which we may be asking from them that they are probably not able to deliver, and we need to be. Uh, cautious about that. Uh, there's one scholar called uh, Stephen Stedman and Rothschild who asked, why do peace agreements fail? And peace agreements sometimes fail because, um, of course, commitment, communication, and uh, what we call core values, core, you know, things that set the, 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 the people who are involved in the conflict uh, value. Again, there's the question about uh, what makes the peace to succeed once you build it? Now, one scholar called Doyle said, um, no, the, the Doyle and Sambanis, they said that you have three things. The, the lev what we call local capacity. Then uh, there is the ferocity of the conflict. How far has that gone in? And the commitment of the international community. So you have three things. The international community, Right. The, the the how far the conflict is, and the local capacities. Thank you. And then Sudan, uh, South Sudan, is uh, challenged in certain fundamental ways in in those fronts. Uh, the international community, like IGAD, is trying, you know, to as much as it Thank could. You. But we need we need a little bit of more analysis and moderation to help these governments and stakeholders to communicate better. Right. Good points. But what what if the international community has vested interests as well? Yeah, the, uh, that, the, the, that will, will be yes, also yes. a tripping uh, yes, yes. tripi wire for the peace process itself. Of, is, that's part of the whole game. You see, um, sometimes people who are external to the conflict can make it worse, or uh, you know, um, abate, or you know, make it uh, to to succeed. Thank you. So, Let's hear so, from so, staff so now. yeah, thank, yeah. You, thank you very much, Doctor Mustafa. Yeah, just picking up from where Mumas left, Adibal, geopolitics. Uh, there's a lot to gain in war, by the way, um, uh, financially. So there are those who do not wish the war to end. Uh, but le le let's congratulate uh, Salva Kiir and Riek Machar for signing this peace agreement. Mm -hmm. um, and we wish them well. Having said this, um, my opinion remains the same, that uh, uh, um, the, the guns should go silent, and that uh, Salva Kiir and Riek Machar, uh, um, and I do hope that they have this wisdom to start uh, uh, finding ways to transfer power to a more youthful, uh, um, not exactly youthful, but you know, uh, uh, 
uh, another set of leaders uh, whether it still have to have those tribal dynamics so that the country can come together between the new era and the Dinka, yeah so be it but that's what they should be I mean, their complexities in conflict as um, ambassador Mwencha is talking about you know the militias associated with mm -hmm. with the tribal guns you know malong paul malong was not in this is not yes. in this deal and he still holds a large militia mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and he was the head of the army for a very long time Thank and you. can complicate or spoil uh, uh, the peace deal. And, and, and lastly, Dibal, I think um, it's important also to use this podium to call for the release of uh, 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 BR uh, uh, Ajak. I, I do not think, based on what he said, if that is what has put him in trouble, yes. I do not think he's a threat to the security of South Sudan. And I think they can process some of these things even when he's out, out, mm -hmm. of, out of jail. Yeah, could they be also uh, threatened by, you know, uh, the young Tak? Because we see Dr. Peter Biara Jack is a young man who is a sharp Tak as well. And uh, they want to keep the status quo, right? So if there is this resurgence of young men who are educated, they're coming from diaspora, and uh, they have a different view and perspective of how they want the country to be run. And we have these old Kuts who are warlords, you know, coming from the bushes, and they are still hanging there, even by the fingernails, uh, they still want to be in power. And they've seen blood shed has been in that country. It is fractured right now. And all we can see is just a band-aid solution. We have young vibrant young men that have the solution. Why shouldn't they be given space? Dr. Pro uh, Professor Noami Damba. Nibal, this is an, an irrational government uh, put up in a desperate time um, uh, for, the, for the convenience of warlords uh, who've been in the bush. Uh, and all other people who are coming in. Um, there has to be a rational and, and there has to be re realignment and rethinking of, of in terms of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, reorganize uh, the uh, renegade uh, troops that are spread all over the country. Uh, begin to gather the arms, small arms. Uh, that are available everywhere and instill some discipline, uh, create a national army and a national police and then begin dealing with the bourgeoning government uh, which they have created, which is irrational, which is not going to help this country. And therefore the point you are talking about the world is that there are hundreds of thousands of diaspora um, South Sudanese diaspora in America, in Europe, Australia, elsewhere, that can come in and be infused in order to support and create capacity uh, that will then uh, develop the answer, deliver the answer for South Sudanese people. Mm -hmm. Just, right. Just, uh, about, uh, just one yeah, adage. Yeah. Let's just hear from Irofi Yutum. We'll okay. so, so I think I think it's impossible to see the condition um, that South Sudan finds itself at the moment as anything else than an intergenerational conflict. Um, Peter is not just um, you know one of the lost boys who managed to get to the U.S. who studied in Harvard and then managed to get a Ph.D. at Cambridge University. Is um, you know a thought leader is able to inspire not just South Sudanese but also Kenyans as he does many times when he's on this show. Um, he's also the chairperson of the South Sudan uh, Young Leaders Forum. Um, so it's not really just an attack on uh, Peter. It's really an attack on a generation of South Sudanese who have something more to offer than simply their knowledge of weapons or their knowledge of uh, militias or their knowledge of uh, uh, armed conflict. And I think for me that's why it's so worrying that Peter remains um, in detention 11 days on uh, despite the uh, progress that we've seen on the mm -hmm. peace agreement. So I think for us... Um, you know, we have to continue to urge if the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs officials are listening to us right now, and I know that your show, uh, Debal, is watched by uh, state you know, officers as well as many, many citizens. We really need to be asking for them to not, be, not to be the last to call for Peter uh, Beer's uh, release. Um, many Americans have done it. Many diplomats have done it. I'm not sure whether there are... Um, our representatives in Juba have actually made this representation, but my request as a Kenyan would be for them to do that. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have our former yeah. diplomats here in the country as well who are in government uh, of, of South Sudan. Uh, we know they're here in the country, mm -hmm. and if they're watching still, we actually are pleading, yes, as uh, of course uh, our, our colleague here, 
in the panel. I think he's been good in advocating, you know, peace processes in South Sudan, and he should be given a table and a, you know, a listening ear as well uh, amongst the Council of Elders, so that uh, if they're mapping out how South Sudan can come out from this morass, I think also that is uh, a sharp track that cannot be allowed just to go down the tubes like that.